Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to the second seminar in this series. I'm Matteo Carpentieri. I'm one of the co-investigators of Braden City, the Feature Urban Ventilation Network, uh, which is a network funded by UKRI and NERC. So just a few words about the aim of the network, which is to develop a technical framework for urban design and innovation and bringing together uh, by bringing together researcher practitioners and policy makers uh, uh, to understand uh, the technical and practical challenges uh, of this. So if you want to know more uh, about uh, what we are planning to do and what uh, what are the, uh, the in more details, the aim of the network, please go to the and have a look at the website, breathingcity.org, as you can see in this slide. Uh, but before we start, uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, the, um, the session is being recorded, so if you don't want to appear in the registration, please uh, stay on mute all the time and then uh, turn on your camera. Please keep yourself on mute during the talk. Uh, if you have questions, please put it in the chat and I'll try to collect all the questions towards the end. Uh, and I, I'll try to relay the questions to, to Martin. Um, having said that, uh, let me introduce the speaker of this uh, seminar. Uh, the speaker today will be uh, Martin van uh, Ruwijk from, uh, the, from Imperial College London. Uh, is a reader at the Department of Civil Engineering, and is going to talk to uh, to us about uh, uh, the um, sorry uh, about the understanding personal exposure in outdoor environments using large edge simulations. So, Martin, uh, up to you. I'll leave the screen to you so you can share your presentation. Thank you very much, Matteo. Um, let's see if I can find my presentation. Oh, God. So this is the first time I'm presenting in um, using, using an iPad. So if things go terribly wrong, I apologize. Um, anyway, um, so today I'll be talking about personal exposure in outdoor environments using large eddy simulation. So there will be, I will be talking about well, what do you have to do to get to personal exposure? And then importantly, what kind of simulations do you need in order to do this in a faithful way? Because one of the big problems, of course, is that the more locally interested you are, the more the local environment matters, right? So if you've got a regional air quality model, you have no real detail about, about the neighborhood at all. But as the more you zoom in, the more details you're going to have to take into account. Um, so before I um, before I start the talk, I and before I forget, I would like to acknowledge um, uh, the team of people that have been working on this for say the last five six years. Um, primarily, uh, my PhD student Tom Grills, who will be kind of uh, the the main author in, in kind of the bulk of the work that I'll be discussing today who's now at the Clean Air Fund. Um, also, Ivo Suter, who is doing now in a postdoc at EMPA, uh, Birgit Sutzel, who's now at ETH, and Sam Owens and David Meyer. Um, then colleagues in the department, Mark Stettler is an, uh, is an emissions expert. So uh, some of the work you'll see today, the emissions calculations were performed by him and his team. Um, so Delft, uh, Harm Jonker and Jasper Thomas, who did some work on the LES code that we're using. Uh, and then at Ecole Centrale, uh, Pietro Salizzoni and Lionel Sulak. Um, and then finally, of course, the LES simulations, they tend to be quite heavy. So we rely uh, very much on high performance computing facilities. So we'd like to acknowledge both the facilities at Imperial College and uh, the national ones in Archer. Um, so the work itself was funded by Climate Kick, Absurk, and, uh, and NERC. Um, so let's just kind of 
dive in and um, in principle the, the the premise of of kind of our work and this is also kind of the vision of the of the breathing cities network is that flow is crucial in connecting emissions to concentrations right so when you kind of look at at this kind of default picture of, of air quality i mean um, you'll see that um, emissions are of course where it all starts and then you've got chemical reactions that take place. So you produce uh, secondary uh, reactants. Um, sunlight is an important one uh, there. And then um, the dispersion, the fluid mechanics in principle tells you where it's going to go and how much it dilutes. So if you want to link, for example, measurements um, to emissions, you need fluid mechanics. And there's lots of uncertainties there. Um, and once you have concentrations, of course, there is the translation to health, which brings you to impacts um, and personal exposure. So we're going to be talking about primarily, well, we're going to be talking about the entire cycle because you can't do a bit of it, but primarily focused on the fluid mechanics and the exposure aspects. Um, now, it is, it is well known that the atmospheric state is very, very important for the air quality you get, right? So light winds, stably stratified simulations, so, sh so shallow boundary layers, they are prone to produce very, very heavy pollution. And uh, these are some uh, pictures from, uh, from China where you see it in, in, a, in say, a, a nice day, um, for example, um, at, the, at the bottom um, and, and, a, and, a, and a very polluted day above. So, the state of the atmosphere is very, very important on the amount of air quality we have. Now, that is well known. The question I'm going to address today, um, apart, uh, aside from other ones, is how do you get the right atmospheric state into LES models? So as, as we'll see, that is not, that's not trivial. So these are the questions that I aim to address to some extent is how can high fidelity turbulence and building resolving large eddy simulation, so LES, help in quantifying personal exposure? Um, and of course, um, the exposure is only as good as the concentrations that you predict. So how do we do that in an accurate way at high resolution? So what do we do about non-neutral atmospheres, like the convective ones that I showed, um, and still retain some of the, I should I say, um, uh, computational advantages that we'd like to make use of. For example, performing simulations that are in a statistically steady state. Yeah, so, so essentially we want to be able to say it's three o'clock, what, what, what's, happening, what's happening now for fundamental studies of air quality. Um, how do we incorporate trees into LES? Vegetation is, of course, if you look around, uh, it, there, there is lots of it around and it has an important effect on air quality. Um, firstly, it captures um, or releases um, pollution, um, but it also affects the flow, right? So, so that is an important thing to look at if we look at very high resolution studies. Um, and then what we end up with looking at is what is the effect of a convective atmosphere and trees on urban air quality? So um, in terms of models, and again, if you think about exposure, um, the type of model you use types uh, uh, depends on the type of question that you want to answer, right? So if you're interested in chronic exposure, then then you know you would select a different model than if you were to uh, be interested in acute exposure. Um, so what I've got here is essentially a scale which uh, which is kind of an inverse scale. So if you go from right to left, the amount of modeling that you do increases, and if you go from left to right, then the cost of the calculations will improve. So the less modeling you do, the more expensive your calculation becomes. Right, so at the far corner is direct numerical simulation, which is essentially we're going to simulate all the, uh, all the turbulence in, in, the, in the atmosphere and in the streets. And 
up to the, well, say, say millimeter scale, right? So that would be extremely expensive. You need billions of cells. Um, you get a very good answers for a very particular, often simplified flow case. So for the kind of work that we do, this is, this is not feasible in general. Um, what is feasible is, um, is large eddy simulation, which is where you apply some turbulence modeling and you only resolve the energy containing uh, scales in the turbulence. Um, and that's what I'll be talking about primarily uh, today. Um, then if we go to more modeling, we end up with Reynolds average Navier-Stokes models, which is where you apply a turbulence closure and you only um, calculate, say, uh, the, well, say steady state often. Um, velocity profiles, it doesn't need to be steady state, but you calculate the average uh, velocities. Um, and if you go even one um, modeling level higher, then you end up with Gaussian plume models, box models, and street network models. Um, so in the study I'm about to present, we compare uh, these street canyon models. I'll say a bit more about that to LES and see how well it works. Okay, so how do street network models work? Well, so essentially what they do is that they model the streets as canyons. So essentially what they do is that if you've got a street with, with the buildings surrounding it, you consider that as a box and you've got, you've got um, pollutants flowing into the box and out of the box. Yeah, so you've got exchange via intersections and you have exchange via, um, via, the, via the roofs. I just need to... Oh, I can't. Oh, we got a pen. So sorry, this is a learning process. So you've got exchange here via via the sides and you've got exchange via the, the top of the canyon. So that's the exchange with the atmosphere and whatever's being exchanged with the atmosphere then is being released and uh, spreads out as a plume. So the advantage of these models is that it's fast. It's, it's relatively robust because you average over, over entire streets and so on. Um, and of course, its advantages are also its disadvantages. You're always working with average data, so you don't really get truly local concentrations. Um, and because you need to assume well mixedness in the canyons, um, there are limitations with respect to the chemistry and so on, and, and also the amount of flow that you can represent. Um, Right, large eddy simulation, on the other hand, it simulates the energetic eddies in a turbulent flow. So if you think about all the, all the eddies, um, you've got this kind of this classical um, energy cascade, right, where you've got this K to the minus five third energy spectrum. So you've got very large scales here, small scales here. And, uh, and the idea is that with large eddy simulation, you say, okay, it's impossible to, to simulate all the scales of the turbulence because they, they range from a kilometer to a millimeter. So we can't resolve that. So what we're gonna do instead is that, well, we know that this is, the, this is the energy density. So we know that the most energetic eddies are these, are the big ones. Um, so what essentially we're going to do is that we're going to cut off our turbulence spectrum because we know that there's a cascade to smaller scales and then it dissipates at the smaller scales. So we're just gonna cut off that, uh, that cascade and just gonna make it shorter. So what you do, the philosophy is that you model the smallest eddies and you resolve the energy uh, containing eddies. So formally you do that by applying spatial filtering to Navier-Stokes and then applying a turbulence closure and you, and you end up with essentially the Navier-Stokes equations where this tilde is the spatial filtering and you end up with this subgrid term and here as well, which you need to model. Um, okay, so we use a code called UDALES, which is derived from the Dutch atmospheric LES simulation, a large eddy simulation model. Uh, so this is a code which has been used for atmospheric flows for a very long time, for at least 20 years. And one of the advantages of that is that the code is kind of made to support full wet thermodynamics. Yeah, because it's the, the, the code supports clouds and all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, and that makes it really ideal for urban applications um, because wet thermodynamics, um, well, as you would say, dry and wet thermodynamics, both play a very important role in the urban environment. So when you have the sun, you've got, of course, sensible heat fluxes coming off the, uh, coming off the, uh, the buildings due to heating. And if you've got water available, it will evaporate and that will produce latent heat fluxes. Um, so all of that is in there. Now the buildings are incorporated with an immersed boundary method, um, which essentially uh, means that, that, that you, well, that the buildings are immersed in the fluid domain. So essentially what you do is if the flow wants to go through um, a building, you say, you can't by applying an opposite forcing. That's roughly how it works. Um, and recently we've equipped the code with a 3D surface energy balance. So this is um, where we look at, we look at the buildings and we model each of the walls and we, we calculate how much heat it absorbs. We calculate how much latent heat is released, how much sensible heat is released. We look at all the radiation, short wave radiation, long wave radiation, and it reflects and so on. Um, so it's quite a, quite a sophisticated um, uh, code in that respect. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that, um, the surface energy balance code today. So I'll keep it a little bit more idealized. So um, what I'll talk about next is our urban air quality simulation with LES in a neutral atmospheric boundary layer. And this is work that was uh, carried out by Tom Grills. Um, and it was his, uh, his, his first uh, paper. So here are some um, pictures. So what we did is that we looked at the South Kensington uh, camp uh, area is essentially, uh, which is Imperial College. So you see the college is, uh, so my, my office is here. This is the Queen's Tower. Uh, this is the National History Museum. And this is the Victorian Albert Museum. Um, and you see there that these are some visualizations of, um, this is actually the velocity field. Um, you see there that how complex the flow is. I will, I will repeat it. Yeah, so we zoom in. Um, so you see how complex the flow is that you get into in, a, in, in, this, in this area. Okay, so this of course, this requires setting up a simulation, um, but if you want to get to air quality, you also need to worry about emissions. And this is where uh, Mark Stettler and uh, his PhD student, uh, Clemence Le Cornec come in. Um, so they calculated emissions via a micro, uh, a traffic micro simulator. So there's, a, there's an animation here so essentially what you do is that you say how, how many cars are there and there, there are kind of traffic counts available. And then you run these, these micro simulators, which kind of, um, well, in, we simulate individual cars. And if you know what the characteristics are of those cars, so what is their type? Is it diesel, petrol? Um, how, how do the engines relate to accelerations uh, and so on? What, and how do they, emit uh, NO, NO2, uh, and so on uh, subsequently, right? So this is how we got our emissions. And um, in order to then bring that into the LES, we introduced line sources. So we kind of averaged out the location of the car, kind of acknowledging that, that we don't know where the cars are. So as a long line source, and every second they release a certain amount of uh, um, a certain amount of pollutants. Um, now inside the code, we've got we've implemented uh, some null cycle chemistry. So this is NO, NO2, and ozone chemistry. So it's it's quite basic, but uh, but it works. One of the advantages of um, of, the, of doing this is that you can, of doing LES, I should say, is that you get information about hotspots. So I should perhaps kind of pause this and just go back. Um, so we're, this is the same simulation, right? So this is the National History Museum. Um, and, and if, for those of you who've been here, the, 
the, the station is here, the, the tube station. Now here on the corner at this little star, that you've got this lovely, lovely place where there's, where there's lots of pedestrianized areas. And uh, so we were kind of curious about, about these, about the people, for example, sitting there in the corner. What would they be exposed to? So we ran our simulation. And what you see here is the instantaneous NOx concentrations. Um, and, uh, and let's see what these people here on this corner are exposed to. Um, and what is, what is very clear um, is, that, is that the peaks that they're exposed to uh, can be very, very large. Yeah, and this is, you see that the wind is actually, it's, 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 it's southwesterly wind. So it's, it's coming from this direction. Um, and you see that the flow in between the buildings is completely, is completely different, as you would expect, but also that there is kind of a mean wind going here. So there's all the traffic from this corner is essentially blown in the direction of that corner. And this will depend on the wind, wind direction, obviously, and also the wind speed. Um, but that's what produces these huge hotspots. So this is just to kind of show one of the, some of the things that, that LES can do for you, um, particularly in, in terms of finding hotspots, this would be very hard otherwise, unless you go walk around with a, with, with, with a monitor and actually measure it. All right. I think I've zoomed in and I don't know how to zoom out. Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. Um, so these are some uh, results. So these are again NOx concentrations. So on the left, you see the uh, the instantaneous NOx concentrations. So now we've zoomed out. So you see the Royal Albert Hall in the north here. Um, and uh, well, it's clearly it's clear that there's very uh, that the the kind of the concentrations are not uniform at all. This is, of course, not something that we would expect. Uh, but um, what you see on the on the figures to the right are in the middle. You see a prediction by Siran, so that's the street network model. So remember that has this mean concentration in the street canyons. And the way you read this figure is that whenever you see, whenever you're at a street, so this is a street. This is the mean concentration in the street canyon. And when you are not in a street, what is plotted is the, um, is, is the concentration at a certain height. Yeah, so that's kind of to get the environment uh, in place. So, so this is the concentration, I think, at 20 meters or 30 meters above the ground. So you, here you see kind of the plumes kind of coming away from, from intersections and, uh, and also the... Uh, the road sections. Um, so this is Siran, that's the street network model. And what we have also plotted here on the right hand side is kind of doing the same, creating the same figure from our LES data. Um, and actually we were surprised at how well this worked, how well Siran was able to, um, to predict the, uh, the concentrations in this street. I mean, admittedly, we've made everything kind of as much the same as we could. So the emissions are of course exactly identical. The friction velocity and everything is exactly identical so that we kind of get the fairest comparison. So what we were after is to just see how good or bad are the kind of approximations taken in the street network approach. Um, and this is Iran, which is a French model, but ADMS Urban, for example, works very similarly. Um, so this, this works, we were very pleased with how well this works. There is some kind of some, some, some details here that are quite different. Um, but overall, you can say that, that actually Saran captures this uh, pretty well. Um, one of the things you can do then is to kind of do some statistics over it. So the statistics we were just looking at for these, for these canyon average concentrations are the top two here. So here we're looking at a slightly more sophisticated uh, simulation. So the previous one was just looking at NOx as a passive scalar. And here we've switched on the null cycle. So we've got NO, NO2 and ozone chemistry. Um, 
And you see, Iran has a little bit more trouble in getting these rights um, for the simple reason that Iran assumes uh, that um, that these these components are always in a photostationary steady state. So there's no transience. And one of the things that you see here, of course, this is from uh, a, a paper by Panijutu and all, is that if you if you release something here and you've got a wind going from left to right, you drive this circulation in the canyon and therefore you get a very inhomogeneous flow inside the canyon. And therefore you do not expect the, uh, the concentrations or the ozone, NO2 uh, and NO concentrations to be in equilibrium throughout this, uh, throughout this uh, volume. And that's what you see here. So the NO concentrations, they're pretty well, uh, represented, but the NO2 concentrations, they're overpredicted by Saran by quite a bit. Um, and the ozone concentrations are severely underpredicted. So um, so when it comes to chemistry, that is harder for these uh, for, for these models because of the spatial average and time averaging that they do. Um, now what you can do with Dales is that you can also look a little bit further at pedestrian exposure, right? So one of the things that we see so is here that the pedestrian exposure, which is kind of the concentrations at, uh, at 1.8 meters above the ground. Um, so you see first that they're significantly higher than those from the canyon average. And that's not surprising, of course, because you're closer to the emission sources. So you will get be exposed to higher concentrations. Um, and what we did for this entire domain here is that we had a wind coming from the southwest. So we split up the domain essentially into, into kind of into parts where we said, okay, so this we call the windward side, and this is what we call the leeward side, right? So we split it up into at this level between the leeward concentrations and the windward concentrations on that side. Uh, to just see what happens, right? Because if you follow this argument, you would you always need to walk on the windward side, right? You'll be exposed to, to less pollution. And, uh, and this is indeed what's brought out by, um, by, the, by the statistics that the, certainly the, on the windward side, the, the concentrations are lower by, I think that will be about 10%. Um, but also you see, if you look at the quartiles, this quartile is much larger than, um, than, than the one on the windward side. So that really kind of tells you that if you've got this kind of this blast of very polluted air, you're going to be exposed to much more, right? So the, uh, the PDF is quite, is quite different. Um, so that is, that is for NO. Uh, this, a similar story holds here for, 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 the, uh, for NO2, but interestingly, the ozone is the other way around. Yes, so ozone is actually slightly higher on the windward side, which is not so surprising because you've got a large excess of NO um, on the leeward side, and that's going to eat up all the, uh, all the ozone. So you're going to have less ozone on the windward, on the windward side. Um, sorry, on the leeward side than on the windward side. Um, okay, so just a little bit about acute personal exposure. This is work that's led by Marcia Otolara um, and Leonard Sulak, so uh, from Ecole Centrale. Um, and what they're interested in is they're really interested in data assimilation and they want to know is how do you use these mobile microsensors for air quality how can you use those in an operational way to improve your model uh, statistics? So Lionel Sulak is the developer of, uh, of Siran. Um, so what they, what they suggested is that we use our LES data to compare the exposure from static sensors and a moving sensor. So what I'm showing here is very, very preliminary, but I thought it's just to, to give a flavor of, uh, of uh, what, what you can use LES simulations for. So here we've got Cromwell Road. We've got the National History Museum here. We're driving down Cromwell Road. And then 
uh, we're driving into Cromwell Place, which you're actually not allowed to do. Um, but uh, but hey, this is a simulation, so we we we, we can dodge the fine, um, and then turn right, and then we turn into Exhibition Road and past the museums towards Hyde Park. So the idea is. We've got one static sensor here, we've got one static sensor there, and then we've got a car which drives through this area. Okay, so these are the, uh, this is an instantaneous picture. The car is, is traveling at 36 kilometers an hour. Um, so sensor two, over this kind of, this time normally of, uh, of, of, of 100 seconds, is, uh, is kind of giving, an average of about 30 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, a little bit further down the road, sensor three gives a slightly higher average and also some more fluctuations. Um, but what is really striking is what, how different the signal is that the mobile sensor picks up. So you see the, the, the peaks it drives through are much, much more severe than the, um, then these, uh, then these static sensors pick up. So there's a real question is how do you use that information um, to, get a, to get an idea and to constrain your model uh, in this way? Um, so some of the questions they're interested in is how many car, car paths do you need to have uh, concentrations to be representative in a statistical sense, right? If you've got one bus, that would be better. Uh, that that would be better than no buses, but you'd prefer to have a hundred buses driving around and, and, and measuring those concentrations. Um, how do you compare moving microsensors against fixed monitoring stations, right? Because essentially, what you're doing, you were driving much faster than kind of the the pollution was moving because of the wind. So so you're picking up much larger kind of hot spots as you as you drive through them um, and uh, and how much noise inaccuracy can these sensors have before the signal becomes unusable so these micro sensors they're often not very accurate they can have drift and so on um, so how much noise or inaccuracy can you have before it's no longer uh, valuable to use the data and when do you know that that it's that it's uh, that the sensor needs to be recalibrated or replaced. All right, good. So at this point, um, I would just like to knock my own simulations. Um, so by just querying how realistic are they actually? Um, and um, point one is that the atmosphere is almost never neutral. Um, we had no trees at all, and you see this is actually quite a leafy, leafy area. So that will have, certainly have substantial influence. Uh, we use a simplified geometry, so we didn't use the real geometry. So the roofs were, for example, all flat and so on. Um, importantly, we didn't have any buoyancy effects. So this is, this links to the atmosphere, but it also links to if the sun heats one side of the road and not the other, then, then you're going to drive, then you get, well, differential heating and you're going to drive convection. Um, the elephant in the room is always the actual emissions. How many cars are there and which type of cars are there? That's going to be, uh, there's going to be a huge source of uncertainty there. And of course, we haven't got any of the turbulence induced by the traffic, right? So we just in, introduce the, um, we just essentially eliminate the cars from our simulation and just introduce a line source. But the cars produce quite a lot of flow in themselves. So um, they will uh, also introduce turbulence. All right, I'm just gonna, looking at the time, um, I'm going to kind of zap through this. I'm just gonna touch on some important things. So lesson one of what we've learned is that non-neutral boundary layers, so convective boundary layers, uh, well, like the one we have we have now, right? It's, it's kind of, it's blue sky, it's, it, it's warming up. And uh, that will produce, that will produce very different flow and turbulence characteristics than neutral boundary layers. And it's important that we account for that in large eddy simulation. 
Um, so the idea of this work was, okay, we know that there's these diurnal cycles and is it possible, so instead of doing, say, neutral boundary layers, is it possible to say, I want to run a simulation with the conditions at 3 p.m. in the afternoon? Yeah, so you know how much heat you're pumping into the atmosphere, um, you know what the wind is, but can you create a steady state simulation that will do that? Because steady state simulations are very, very good to understand how, how the city and the, and the atmosphere interact and then how that impacts on air quality. Right, so I'm not gonna go in detail of this, so what we've done is we've done an LES of a full uh, atmospheric boundary layer. And then what we do is that we just cap it. So we just only simulate a part of that boundary layer and we introduce heating and we see how bad that is. And um, the main thing that I want you to focus on is this figure here. It's the figure here on the right. This is the turbulence kinetic energy. So this black line is say the ground truth. That is, that is the, those are the LES for the full atmospheric boundary. So we've got all the turbulent scales in there um, and so on. And what we have here is that the blue, yellow and, and, and blue, we have got capped boundary layers. The first one is something like 125, the second is 250 and so on. Um, and what is very, very clear here is that you sick, significantly underestimate the turbulence kinetic energy. And that is a real problem because obviously the turbulence kinetic energy is the amount of energy in the turbulence. So that is how much energy you have available to mix. So that's gonna have a massive impact on, um, on your simulation outputs. So it's important to get this right. Um, and the way to get this right is that you have enough um, is that you have enough height. So what we find is that if you do a convective um, simulation, you need at least five Obukov lengths to obtain correct TKE level. So the physics of that, that's about say 500 meters, but perhaps. And why do you need that? Because you need your overturning eddies to be large enough to, to produce enough turbulence. Um, and you see that if you do that, then, um, then you're gonna get much better results. So that's, that's what you see here. Anyway, so we've solved this and we can run these in a steady state. So we can perform non-neutral boundary layers in a statistically steady state. And this, uh, we can do that both for convective situations. So say summertime, daytime, and also for stable situations. So nighttime, uh, situations. Okay, so that is the interaction of the of the urban surface with the atmosphere. Now, if we look inside the street canyons, there is these trees, and these trees they're incredibly interesting objects, which um, you need to take care of when you do LES, right? So in in the very kind of at the very large scale models, you just say, okay, I just have a tree and it just occupies a region. If you were to do DNS, you say, well, I'm just going to model every leaf. But what we need to do is to have something, some kind of model in the middle where we model the effect of the tree on the larger scales of the flow, right? So it's, we're kind of in this gray zone. So we developed a model to incorporate trees into LES, which is kind of as simple as, as it gets. So, but we try to make it complete in the sense that it kind of, that we've got all the processes in there. So what does it include? Trees exert drag on the flow that create small scale turbulence. They absorb, reflect and emit short and long wave radiation. They evaporate water. Um, they deposit and release aerosols. Um, and of course, they, um, th there's, there's latent and or the sensible heat fluxes coming off it. Um, and perhaps the, the, the worst thing of all, well, <laughs> worst thing if you try to model it is that they are alive, meaning that they can regulate themselves. So if a tree comes in under water stress, it will shut its stomata and so on. 
um, so they regulate themselves. Okay, so what we want to do is that there can we de de can we develop a, a model which is as simple as possible, but still has all the mechanisms that we want. Um, so in terms of drag and deposition, we we just use standard uh, closure. So we just uh, just use a drag parameterization um, for. For, for the drag it enforces, aerosol deposition is just a standard deposition velocity. Um, what is what was the hardest bit to get right was to model the energy balance, because the question is: so you've got you've got the sunlight coming in, then part of it gets stored or gets absorbed by the leaves, and then part of it goes through and hits the uh, hits say the pavement. And there it's absorbed there or partially reflected and so on. Um, and then, of course, whatever gets absorbed inside the trees, um, you've got this photosynthesis going on. So you've got latent heat, sensible heat. How does that, um, how does that distribute? And um, we thought about this for a long time because what we wanted to avoid is to end up with a, with a model that had kind of 100 parameters. Um, so what we did in the end is that we just assumed that we've got sunlight coming from above, it gets absorbed, and we, we assume that that occurs in a slightly homogeneous way, which means that we can use the Lambert-Beer law um, and, and assume that the absorbed radiation is, uh, is, is, decays exponentially. Now, what's very important, because you're looking at a real um, surface energy balance, albeit simplified, is that if you've got 400 watts coming in, the ground is going to absorb a lot of it. So if it were all in, 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 in equilibrium, then there would be 400 watts going out, which means that you would get massive sensible heat fluxes and you get nonsense. So you really need to take into account the storage as well. So we use a simple model for that. So this is how much energy is stored in the model. And then once you've got that, you can calculate how much uh, latent heat and how much sensible heat is kind of uh, produced by the trees. Um, and once you, once you do this, you can um, identify two main cooling mechanisms by which trees provide cooling, right? So the first one is by transpirational effects. And this is what is often called the oasis effect. Um, you evaporate heat, and that, of course, if you evaporate heat, that or you evaporate water, that that means that the energy needs to come from somewhere, so the air will cool down. So that's that's the cooling. And then the second part is reduced radiation received by the ground. So that's the actual shading. Um, so I'm not going to go into this because of uh, because of time, but um, you can, using this model, you can learn a lot about, about how trees work. And we're, we're very pleased to see that you can actually kind of do dimensional analysis and come up with a regime diagram, which kind of tells you, depending on how much radiation do you absorb and how much uh, of that is kind of released via latent heat fluxes, you can define these different regimes and, um, and say, well, if you're in this regime, you're going to have a net cooling effect, which is dominated by transpiration. And in this re regime, your trees are just going to heat the atmosphere. Anyway, um, I want to spend the last few minutes uh, talking about um, how to incorporate this into LES. So this is kind of a, a quick simulation um, without any urban environment. So we've got a wind coming left to right. So you see here that the tree is here, it's modeled as a block. So you see that, well, clearly there's drag because you get this whole wake forming. Um, the temperature is very interesting because you're gonna get lots of heat being absorbed in the top. So you see that the top actually heats the atmosphere. So you get this hot plume coming from the top of the tree. And then below it, you see that transpiration, evapotranspiration starts dominating. So you get cooling underneath so you get some really interesting physics um, 
and the, at the bottom you see the uh, the actual kind of moisture, the water vapor um, being released from this tree. Okay, good. Um, so essentially, what we have we've got this tree model. It's as simple as possible, um, but it is complete. And what can we say about air quality? That's what I like to spend the last few minutes on. Um, so what we have here is, um, is the same case, but now we put the trees in. So in order to get the trees, what we did is that we use ordnance survey data and we manipulated that such that we could get a tree map. So we extract from the digital data, we extract a tree map. And then we superimpose our buildings, which we already had with the tree map to get the domain you see on the right. Um, so we simulate on a sunny day, there's some broken clouds. Uh, we've, got a, um, we've got a ground heat flux of 100 watts per square meter. Um, what we use is our steady state methodology for the convective case. So we can kind of do a real sunny day. Um, and um, we have taken the trees to be all of this Platanus uh, acerifolia, uh, the London plane tree. So we've given it these properties. Um, and uh, so to just finish off, um, what we show here is the difference between a convective simulation and a neutral simulation, and it's a relative. So it's convective minus neutral divided by neutral. Um, so are convective conditions important for air quality? Well, you see that in lots of the uh, domain, air quality is 50% better than, um, than, than elsewhere. There's of course regions where it's higher. So, so there's other regions where it's, where you get 50% higher um, concentrations. But overall, if you look at the whole, the uh, convective conditions tend to um, improve air quality. And that's not surprising because you get a lot more turbulence and therefore you get a lot more mixing and therefore all the concentrations or all the emissions which take place in the in in the streets are more efficiently transported out of the streets um, and the final question here is do trees improve air quality and um, here we've got the nox concentrations um, so on the left you see the relative concentrations so this is convective with trees minus convective divided by the convective, right? So this is again a relative. So we've got a convective simulation and then we put the trees in and then we look at the relative difference. And uh, what you see here is that overall, what our model suggests is that trees have a detrimental impact on, uh, on air quality for the parameter settings we use. So that there is deposition in there but it's just the fact that blocking by trees, yeah, because trees block the exchange with the atmosphere. So the blocking by trees uh, dominates the, uh, this balance. So they do absorb, um, well, pollutants, but not at the same rate at which they block it. So if you've got a source inside this canyon and it's just pumping out pollution, it will just restrict how much you can uh, how, how much you can exchange with the atmosphere. So you see over very large areas, all the busy roads, trees tend to um, reduce uh, the air quality and make it worse by you know between twenty and fifty percent. Now, on on the bright side, if you have a pedestrianized um, road, so for example, the road in front of my building. Yeah, so this is uh, Imperial College Road. Um, there's no cars there. And you see, here you see the kind of the cleansing effect that the trees have. So you see that actually this, the, the air quality is improved by the trees as long as you don't have heavy polluted sources kind of emitting stuff into, uh, into the canyon. Um, right, so to conclude, um, for realistic simulations of urban environments, the stability of the atmosphere is important and trees are important. You saw they had very kind of substantial consequences on our simulation results. Um, LES in neutral 
conditions tend to overestimate NOx pollution levels in street compared to convective boundary layers. Um, trees tend to deteriorate air quality in streets with traffic due to reduced exchange with the atmosphere. And coming back to the uh, personal exposure point, LES is a very powerful tool that can help in understanding personal exposure and how to mitigate it, right? So should you walk on the other side of the road, should you take a different road and so on? And uh, I think an important role for, is, for it is that you can use it to inform coarser and faster models that you can use for real-time prediction. So what you can do is you can use it to learn from and then parameterize things uh, in much faster models and then use those in an operational sense. Right, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I think it was really, really uh, interesting. Um, so as I said at the beginning, please, if you have questions, do uh, write them in the in the chat and I will relay them to, to Martin. We, uh, so let's, uh, let's start with a question that put a while ago uh, there by Nicolas. Uh, he was asking, uh, referring to one of the first um, slides, I think the, the study about by Gridus et al, the, the, the simulation on the uh, Imperial College campus. Yeah. He was asking questions about the, uh, the size of the domain, uh, both in physical terms and computationally. So I, I might have, you're right. I, well, as, you, as you will have noticed, I tried to squeeze too much into this presentation. Um, so I, I had removed that, but it, they're very similar to what we have here. Uh, can you still see my screen? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, okay. So the domain is 700 by 1400 by, by, well, for that neutral simulation, it wasn't quite 600 meters. It was a little bit, was a little bit less high. And uh, the grid was uh, 384 by 768 by 192 grid cells. And we use a grid clustering um, near the surface. So we got a resolution of about two meters spatially. Excellent. Um, we got another question by uh, Kyla uh, referring to the animations that you've shown there, and in particular the one showing the movement of uh, vehicles on the street. Yes. And, uh, asking whether they are purely illustrative or if the visualization, visualization present data resulting from your simulation. Well, so. Um... So it's this, it's this animation here, I think. Um, so this is, this is VISIM. So what VISIM does is that essentially it calculates traffic flows. Um, so what you feed into it is how, how many cars are coming from everywhere. And then it will just kind of simulate how these cars behave, right? So, so it's essentially there's someone in every car and he's going somewhere and so on. So, um, so that's what you do. And then what you, what, what you get from that are essentially the trajectories of every single vehicle. And uh, we use those trajectories, we couple them to an emissions model, and then we get, as a function of time, we get the emissions of NO, NOx, PMs, and all that kind of stuff. And that is what we then feed into our LES code. So it's it. There are, it is real in the sense that it's used in VSIM to calculate the particle, the car trajectories. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there is time for a couple of questions if people have uh, other questions. So again, please uh, do write them in the chat. While we wait for other people to come up with questions, I actually have one for you, Martin. Is I mean, you've shown this very nice LES presentation, uh, very complex, and they are able to capture a lot of details. But of course, they are uh, computationally expensive. So Absolutely. how do you see the role of LES in to assessing personal exposure in, in cities? I mean, uh, it, it, it is probably something we cannot apply to every possible scenario. But, um, what do you think the role of LES is going to be? 
Well, I think I think LES can teach us a lot about because one of the problems that we have, of course, is that is that lots of processes are coupled over different length scales and different time scales. And LES is a great tool to help you understand a lot about this for the simple reason is that you've got all the data available and you can you've got kind of ideal control over boundary conditions and uh, and emissions and all that kind of stuff so it's it's ideal for process studies um in terms of personal exposure so you can for example and this is work that i haven't done yet but if you imagine that you've got this big simulation and you've got say six hours of 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 simulation time you can have thousands and thousands of people kind of walking through this area and you can kind of build up a map of personal exposure in this area to to a lot of to a lot of detail i mean and this is where les has a real kind of strength i think because you get really localized information right so do you walk past this very polluted corner or not and what is its effect on your exposure um now in terms of the broader um, kind of question of personal exposure, um, it is just one facet in a, in a whole palette of tools. I mean, clearly uh, measurements are, are, are very, very important to carry out and they're kind of an ideal way to measure personal exposure, um, except of, you know, how does your body kind of modulate the, uh, the concentrations that you actually observe um, and, and how accurate are the sensors that you're wearing. Um, but that, that, is, that is a very obvious way to go. You've got wind tunnel studies. Um, and so I think, I think it, this is such a broad question that we need, that we need all, all the tools and kind of, because each tool kind of builds something new. For example, wind tunnels, it's much easier to do much longer experiments. So LES is, is very, very expensive. Um, and, and in a wind tunnel, if you, if you let it blow for 10 minutes longer, that is, that's fine, right? Um, and uh, and, and, and it's, it's much more cost effective, if you like, from that perspective. Thank you. And uh, actually related to this, uh, Ari is asking uh, how expensive it is in terms of computing research in how many processors on, uh, how many hours well so i think the simulations that you saw here they are about so they run with i think so so 300 cores and then you know but they run they run for a long time um so they i think they run for for, for a week or two weeks um so we do restarts um because it takes a long time to to get statistical convergence. I mean, that's one of these these things. So very often when we do LES, we look at these steady state simulations. But if you ask yourself, how long does it take to reach a steady state or to kind of get something which is statistically converged, you know, that might be close to a day, right? So 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 this whole question of of is there a steady state? Um, practically right so because if we think it takes a day to get statistical convergence well we've got 24 hours we've got a diurnal cycle right it's been night in the meantime and everything will be completely uh, completely different again um yeah so uh, so they're expensive uh, simulations um and but but at the moment what we've done is that we've kind of with this two meter resolution um this is kind of feasible. And, and if we go to one meter, um, so we, we half the resolution, it will become 16 times more expensive. Yeah, so it's, it's quite a subtle, subtle game. So that just means that all of a sudden you're gonna be talking about, you know, 15,000 processors and, and that kind of stuff. So then you're in a different league. This is where we aim to go because what we want to do ultimately is to, for example, do LES of a full city. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a bit conscious with time and I don't see any new question in the chat. So I'll thank you again uh, for this very interesting presentation. It was a and pleasure. I invite, uh, and I'll invite everybody uh, in two weeks time for the next, uh, uh, for the next uh, talk in the seminar series. Thank you very much.